Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs are fighting the construction of a natural gas pipeline. Why do you think they're they're doing what they're doing? Well, part of it is uh, for money. They got over about two million dollars since they've been started. No one talk to this guy. He's a f***ing fascist. You, no one talk to him. This is northern British Columbia, just outside Smithers, B.C., home to some of the most pristine landscape in all of Canada and also the traditional territory of the Wet'suwet'en people. But this tranquil environment has also seen some of Canada's most contentious political fighting, pitting family against family, clan against clan, and five so-called hereditary chiefs against elected chief and councils of First Nation communities. But is this entire dispute really about a pipeline? Are these hereditary chiefs really who they say they are? Or have environmental groups exploited a pre-existing situation and personal grievances in a bid to stop the project? Let's go get the truth. For them, it's not about the Aboriginal rights and title. It is about power and control and asserting it or abusing it. I do have a voice and nobody's going to tell me to be quiet. My name is Aaron Gunn and this is Politics Explained. Protesters who joined Indigenous leaders opposed to a natural gas pipeline in BC have been causing major disruptions. Via Rail has now cancelled all commuter train service across Canada because of the ongoing blockades. In February 2020, protests opposing the construction of the coastal gasoline pipeline erupted across the country. As protesters, angered by RCMP actions in what is traditional Wet'suwet'en territory, erected illegal blockades on rail lines, highways, and other critical infrastructure all with the purpose to, in their words, shut down Canada. Throughout the unrest, a common refrain heard from protesters was their commitment to, quote, stand in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people. And more than two years later, not much has changed. With protests less frequent perhaps, but also occasionally much more violent as well. One such peaceful demonstration was recently held in Vancouver, specifically targeting RBC Bank for financing the project. My film crew and I drove past the gathering protesters to plan out a way to best capture the footage and find out what they had to say. Okay, so we just passed the protesters. They're just a couple blocks away. They're kind of in the middle of a field. It'll be a little too obvious, I think, for myself to approach. So we're gonna send Colin in a little undercover, a little incognito. Good luck, Colin. Thanks. See what you can uh, see what you can get. Okay, I'm gonna go now. Okay. targeted by police. So those of us who sit in more privilege, those of us with um, white cis bodies, we make sure that we are taking care of the others. TGO stands for Coastal Gas Link. It's the company that's basically making the pipeline because they're currently violating indigenous law and they're going to poison the water with their pipeline. Okay, so we are going to march. Woo! Solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people as the drilling has started. 
protect the sovereignty of the Wet'suwet'en people. R.B.C. is killing me. Remember there's no planet B. Fossil fuels pollute and spill. Dive us now to kill the drill. R.B.C. is killing me. Remember there's no planet B. One more time. R.B.C. So we're here in Vancouver, just outside the RBC branch in Kitsilano, where there's a big protest coming to try to get RBC to defund the coastal gassing pipeline. So we're gonna go, we're gonna try to talk to some of these protesters. Can I ask you what brings you out here today? You should really talk to the organizers. <laughs> yeah, we literally just stepped and I walked here right since yeah. Yeah. Are you one of the organizers? Yeah, on. Okay, oh, awesome. Thank you for the action. Thank you so awesome. Much. Awesome. Are you a answering questions or? I can, yeah. yeah. Uh, what media outlet are you? Just with on? me. Just I got a YouTube channel and that, that's all. Okay. What, what's Aaron your name? Gunn. Aaron Gunn. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, I'd be happy to answer. Sure. Uh, so first thing, well, first of all, congratulations on a very impressive turnout. And uh, what's the main driving force here? So, this action is being organized by the Decolonial Solidarity Campaign, or a national uh, project, largely run and operated by settlers. Uh, we take all of our leadership from the uh, hereditary chiefs, the Wet'suwet'en Nation. You mentioned working with uh, the Wet'suwet'en, but you have all the different houses, and then you have the elected bands, and then you have the hereditary leaders that you referenced. Uh, the elected band councils are those who have signed in their support for CGL and TMX and other fossil fuel projects. Um, those systems are put in place by the colonial powers that be. Um, they're designed to be mouthpieces of the federal government. And this is just one small action to register our dissent and our refusal to be complicit in uh, the settler colonial project. While various environmental and activist groups claim to stand with the Wet'suwet'en people in opposition to the pipeline, they all ignore one very inconvenient fact. All 20 elected First Nation bands along the pipeline route support the project and have signed agreements with Coastal GasLink, including the five Wet'suwet'en bands located in what is considered traditional Wet'suwet'en territory. And uh, one final question for you uh, regarding the hereditary chiefs. I think it feel like it seems odd to most Canadians to have kind of a decision-making process based on um, uh, non-elected leadership. How would you explain that to most Canadians? It's not our place as white settlers to question that kind of system that has had such a long history of success. But regardless, it's our responsibility as settlers on stolen land to listen to that governance and follow it. Yeah, we'll just we'll just walk through for for just B-roll, just B-roll. Yeah. Uh, you guys do? Uh, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. Yeah. Did you want to add to your YouTube channel? Uh, Aaron Gunn. Oh, f you, <laughs> you f fascist! I thought you talked about going to the downtown east side. Yeah. You brought f cops to the downtown east side with you. How you talk to cops? How you you use the you push the narrative of criminalization on homeless people? Why well, I interview homeless people? Five, you know, so f you. Well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, eh? No one talk to this guy. He's a f fascist. So he you. No one talk to him. Thank you for your the escort through uh, through the crowd. Just f off. After that exciting encounter, we still found ourselves with more questions than we had answers. Do protesters really represent the wishes of the Wet'suwet'en people? What is the role of the elected councils? And who, maybe most importantly, are these hereditary chiefs? What was clear was the next stop on our journey had to be Northern BC and the traditional territory of the Wet'suwet'en people where we first sat down with Wet'suwet'en matriarch Bonnie George for a traditional home-cooked meal of moose stew, followed by a rundown of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary system. Am I, am I right to say there's 13 house chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en? Mm -hmm. And are those considered, like when people say the hereditary chiefs, are they talking about the 13 mm -hmm. clan They should chiefs? be, okay. yeah. 
Uh, we have two governance systems in place. One is the band council system, the other is hereditary system. Each hereditary house group, there are 13 houses within Novotsudin, has autonomy and a say as to what happens within their territory called Anaknuaten. But we don't have a central governance system, a model, where the nation decides on who's going to be speaking for us as a nation. Due to this lack of a unified governance model, internal differences that might otherwise have been settled democratically have been allowed to fester for years. The traditional Wet'suwet'en territory is located in north central BC and encompasses the settlements of Burns Lake, Houston, Smithers, as well as other smaller communities. Within this territory are five indigenous Wet'suwet'en bands who oversee the delivery of services to First Nations who live on their respective reserves. These bands are governed by chief and councils that are democratically elected by the First Nations who live there, not unlike a municipality. This elected system was first introduced and is recognized by the federal government and is part of the Indian Act. There also exists a parallel governance structure known as the hereditary system that is comprised of five clans and 13 houses, each led by a chief. Clan membership is passed down through matrilineal lines, while hereditary titles are usually inherited. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs claim domain over the entire traditional territory. The divide between the elected and hereditary leadership can largely trace its origins to the beginning of the pipeline debate, which some may be surprised to know actually began before the coastal gas link pipeline when a handful of hereditary chiefs supported the Unistoten camp or blockade meant to impede the construction of the Northern Gateway oil pipeline back in 2010. But after that pipeline was killed by the Trudeau government, protesters fixed their sights on a new target, Coastal Gas Link, a natural gas pipeline that was set to be built along a similar route. These protesters, led by activist Molly Wickham, were once again supported by a group of hereditary chiefs through an incorporated entity known as the Office of the Wet'suwet'en, or OW. The Office of the Wet'suwet'en came about after the Dalgamut court case. It was put together for the six elected councils and the five hereditary chiefs to be able to sit down and govern the Wet'suwet'en people. Well, those six uh, elected council chairs have never been filled. We don't get invited. So I think that um, that office was put together for the Wet'suwet'en people, um, but it, it hasn't served our community. In the years that followed, all five elected Wet'suwet'en bands along the pipeline route signed benefit sharing agreements with Coastal GasLink to support the project including the Wet'suwet'en First Nation Band led by then-elected Chief Karen Ogin Toes. It's hard when you live within a community and you can't even drink the water. Uh, poor housing, uh, overcrowding, lack of housing, our education levels are low. You know, we have maybe a handful of our members that have post-secondary degrees. So all of those things are looked to the leadership to, to resolve for the community. And does that benefit sharing agreement with Coastal Gas Inc. help those communities and the council achieve some of those things? Yes, it does. Unlike the elected bands, however, the office of the Wet'suwet'en did not receive benefit sharing agreements with Coastal Gas Link, who preferred to deal directly with the elected chief and councils. But this isn't to say the OW doesn't receive any funding. It does including in the form of grants from massive environmental groups such as Tides Canada. However, ENGOs aren't the only place the OW gets their money. In fact, in 2020, as illegal blockades ravaged the country in the name of these hereditary chiefs, the federal and provincial governments negotiated what was effectively a ransom payment worth millions of dollars directly with the OW. 
This was called the Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, and was signed without the consent of the elected chief and councils. From what we understand is that they've, they've been applying for money on behalf of our communities, but we don't get little to no services at all. The province, once the MOU was signed, they had given $7.2 million to the Office of the Wet'suwet'en. And part of that was to reunify the Wet'suwet'en people, which has not happened. Mm -hmm. There's been no invitations to meetings, there's been no invitations to any feasts at all. There's still, uh, the communities are still fractured yet. Uh, they've been there 30 years and I don't think they've created one job for one person in this community. And that's the sad thing about it, because I don't know how much money they've got, but it's in the uh, multi-millions. They take the money, but they don't give it back to the community. They think they speak for the, the whole community and all the other um, clans, but they don't. They don't consult, they don't have meetings, they, don't, they have closed door meetings. They got this hoax, I call it a hoax, the memorandum of understanding from the federal and the provincial governments for, uh, for us to build unity. Mm -hmm. And it's only the Fab Five and those, that entity's benefiting from it. Are they supposed to be getting money to benefit the community? Or oh yeah, they? they are. They, they got $7.4 million over four years are, that uh, they're supposed to be uniting the Wet'suwet'en and strengthening the Wet'suwet'en system, which have they, they're have not. They been doing that? No, no they're, they're traveling all over to Toronto and wherever else I heard they went to Switzerland. Do you feel like when the government made that uh, agreement with the, the office of the Wet'suwet'en, they kind of undercut all of the elected chief and councils that have kind of been working constructively? Yeah, that was pretty ironic. Uh, the very system that has been imposed upon us was the very system that both the provincial and, and uh, federal governments ignored. Yeah. It's just idiotic. I, I, I don't have any other word for it. Like, you know, the federal government imposed the system on us and then they go and sign an MOU and completely ignore the elected councils. Far from uniting the Wet'suwet'en people, the money given to the OW and the protesters they support may be inflaming tensions even more. As professional activists like Molly Wickham, who is currently facing criminal charges, have continued their campaign of blockades and intimidation, while using their large reach across social media to entice increasingly radicalized individuals from across North America to join their cause. A lot of the protesters that you see that are all over the media and everything, are they all Wet'suwet'en? Are they all from the community? Oh, absolutely not. I think there's probably one or two Wet'suwet'en out there, aside from those monkeys that you see prancing around with their um, costumes now, I call them. There are Americans from back east and there's a few Mohawks. You can tell by their accent because you hear those videos. These uh, outsiders, these um, foreign uh, organizations that have been funding uh, this group, they perpetuate the divide within the Wet'suwet'en people and communities and they need to just back off and let the Wet'suwet'en people find a path forward because from my perspective, as long as the Wet'suwet'en communities are divided, we can't move forward. This is a Wet'suwet'en issue that needs to be resolved by Wet'suwet'en people, not by outsiders. This point was made clear to protesters when they attempted to blockade a major rail line in Wet'suwet'en territory in 2020. Instead of successfully setting up their blockade as they were able to do in much of the rest of the country, protesters were met defiantly by Bonnie George and other Wet'suwet'en matriarchs who demanded they leave their traditional territory immediately. I met with Bonnie and Philistine Olson at the exact spot where this tense encounter took place to find out exactly what happened. Towards the end of the day when, when I got a call from my auntie and uh, we checked things out, there was nobody around, but we checked things around and you can see that they had trucks, um, vehicle trucks going up to the train tracks. And by that point, by that day, they already had supplies up there to build their um, structure that they were going to block the railway. And so we walked up there, her and I walked up there and we saw the dozer was still there and a pile of materials and the pile of pallets. 
So, so there's no doubt that they were planning to erect a very big blockade here. And uh, the one fellow, he come walking, it was just getting dark, he come walking towards us and I came out of the car. He said he was uh, just checking things out and, he, and then he said to me that I had no right doing what we're doing here. I said, excuse me, I said, do you know who I am? I am from Tsakalbia. This is our house territory. We're here to take care of everybody. How could you say you don't know me? And I have no right. But as you know far as I'm concerned, is, do you know who's territory as far as I'm concerned, you guys don't actually have any power. Who's you guys? This is our territory. This is like Silly's territory. My house. Mm. Who do you think I am? They just stood there like he was, uh, I don't know, he was like, he was waiting for me to retaliate with physical force, maybe. And they, they did not care who they were going to hurt. They did not care what they were going to do to hurt people. And you were, you were um, set up here for almost three weeks. So the idea was to, to block them from getting to bringing their stuff to the railway to block everybody else in a way. Yeah, prevent, yeah. Uh, prevent uh, mishap. Mm -hmm. We made sure that those areas were patrolled, that they weren't able to weasel their way in there. And finally, after three weeks, they got the hint that we didn't want them around here anymore. We stayed here day in and day out. People came um, from other communities, other families. They supported us. They were glad. They were really, really happy to see that we could stand up to all of this. Is this the literal spot where you guys were? For, okay, this is it Let's right Let's walk here. up to, we'll show can you we? where, yeah, we can walk up okay. there. So if we didn't stop that blockade, it would have been right here. Was that, was that like the, from a community perspective, was this kind of the most dramatic thing that you've seen with the police and CN and all the media? Like, I would say so. Yeah. 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 Like it was pretty much every day the top story for at least two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Canada, it was. until COVID happened, basically. Yeah, it shook our community up, but lots of people were proud that we we stood up here. I feel like lots of Canadians came away with maybe the wrong impression that it was like, you know, the entire community is rising up and and making these blockades. But it was almost the exact opposite, where you had a community rise up to stop a blockade mm -hmm. in, in this in this case. And we did this all on our own. We never got no no GoFundMe money. Mm -hmm. We never begged anybody for money to support us through this. Mm -hmm. Everybody looked after each other. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, Philistine and the other women who stopped this rail blockade did so in defiance of the OW and the five hereditary chiefs who supported these protests. In response, Bonnie was publicly shamed in a process known as feathering. These disgruntled Fab Five try to humiliate me again in the public. Again, have they tried it before? Oh yeah, they um, they tried to feather me, which is they put feathers on top of your head, eagle down feathers, and that's called shaming you. And they pointed out a whole bunch of stuff saying that I did this and did that, whatever. Why they did that is because I've been with a project for, since 2011, and that was their fighting tool, but they tried to throw all this other stuff in to make me look incompetent as a person, as a Wet'suwet'en matriarch. So to see how our women were treated, they were shamed, scorned, um, it, it was sad to see. But these five hereditary chiefs, led by John Risdale, didn't stop at publicly shaming matriarchs who happened to support the coastal gasling pipeline. They also took the unprecedented step of unilaterally stripping the hereditary names of the other female house chiefs that opposed them, taking those names and giving them instead to their friends or, in some cases, even themselves. For example, the hereditary chief title of Smogeth Gim of the Sun House was stolen from Gloria George and given to Warner Nizel, the brother of an OW board member, while the hereditary chief title of Woos of the Grizzly House was taken from Darlene Glam and given to Frank Alec, an outspoken critic of the coastal Gaslink pipeline. Could you tell me who, how you managed to steal a matriarchal name, Chief Woos? How'd you steal that name? It was a year ago today. How'd you steal it? 
Teresa Tate Day, another female matriarch, also had her hereditary title, Waha Light, stolen from her, signaling to all hereditary chiefs that if you don't fall in line with the OW, they will strip you of your name and cultural identity. We had a public meeting in Houston, um, at our territory, Quenbeya territory, and uh, where the hereditary male chiefs came in and said, we're not allowed to speak about this. And um, this goes against our system uh, totally, because everybody has a voice, everybody has an opinion. Um, we have male chiefs asserting their right as male chiefs and women that, that uh, were um, supporting LNG, they got their names stripped. They didn't do anything wrong, um, but because they um, supported LNG, they got their names stripped. But what those guys did to those ladies who they claimed to strip the names from, they just went ahead and did it. They just went ahead, um, people whispered about it, saying they're going to do this, but nobody spoke up because they're bullies. And uh, it's unheard of. Uh, there's no such thing as people taking your names. When you are born, you are born into a house, nobody can come into your house and take something from you. That's against the law. It's against the Canadian law. It's against our law. Nobody does that. It's unheard of. It's uncalled for. It has never been done before. And this was an assault on our women. It's like kicking your grandmother when your grandmother is down. That's how it felt to me. Because I held my grandmother's names. You know, and that was a lack of respect for our culture and tradition and what they did. They feathered me in the feast hall. So I, I see a whole sort of faction of, of, of taking our traditional system and, and making it their own mm -hmm. and making up rules as we go, breaking traditional law. How, how did yeah. it feel to you when this whole sudden they just took your name from you? They didn't take my name. They think they did. They did not take my name. I am still a hereditary chief. Nobody can come and take your name. Stripping names and titles isn't the only thing these hereditary chiefs have done that goes against Wet'suwet'en and even Canadian law. In fact, many of them have ignored these traditions completely. Ask anybody about when there's a death in the community, everything is on hold. But the Fab Five, the OW chiefs, they had a rally in Smithers to protest the pipelines on the day of Sophie's funeral, which is a really high matriarch. And another thing is when they put on the regalia, they're only supposed to use it for ceremonies. You know, the OW, as soon as they get a camera on, they all dress up and they walk out. They know it's wrong and we know it's wrong and we know uh, who they are and, uh, and that they're really not chiefs. On top of breaking cultural traditions, John Risdale, the most outspoken hereditary chief in the fight against the pipeline, committed the shocking and disturbing crime of shooting and killing his neighbor's dog while intoxicated, resulting in a criminal charge. For example, the, the chief that uh, shot a dog while um, under the influence of alcohol, to me, that's not good behavior. That's not how you conduct yourself as a head chief of any clan. To me, that looks, that, that is a prime example of somebody that should be getting stripped of, of their name. The turmoil brought to the community by the fight over the pipeline has led to an unprecedented amount of infighting among not only Wet'suwet'en leadership, but many of the Wet'suwet'en people themselves. To address these issues head on and to start the process of healing, Bonnie and other matriarchs called a potluck just south of Houston, in which we were invited to attend. So we're on our way to see Bonnie George and her family. We have no idea what to expect, but hopefully we can talk to many uh, Wet'suwet'en members and find out more about their history, their culture. So we're excited for it, but we have no idea what to expect and uh, we'll see what happens. Name's Aaron Gunn, uh, here visiting from Victoria, and very uh, honored to be here and excited to be here. And um, don't obviously have a house name or anything like that, although I'm uh, big on history. And uh, being Scottish, they actually have a clan system as well that everyone originally gets their name from. So the Gunn clan is from the very northern tip of, of Scotland. And uh, so it's kind of interesting that wherever you travel in the world, there's 
think that more that uh, holds us together that then uh, divides us apart. I respect the chiefs that respect us. You see all the hereditary chiefs out there? That They don't respect us. They're all out there making money and stuff. I'm just getting so tired of it. Even as a young child, we were always told, even if we didn't have a name, our words meant something. That's what the, our leader is supposed to do, talk with all of us like what we're doing around here. Whether you are got a name or not, your voice matters. And that's what's not happening today. We need to teach our younger one to, not the way we are today. Fighting, fighting, there, there, there. You know, but it's not the way our kids gonna grow up and learn. We're the one that have to teach them now. So what's going on today is um, not our way of living like our elders did what they taught us. That was uh, part of my vision was, like Bonnie said, reunification of our nations, all the five bands. People don't realize that. Many of our band councils have hereditary chiefs in them. The last council I sat on, there was uh, seven hereditary chiefs sitting on a table. OW, they don't understand that. You see what's happening out here now. You get them down territory. One young lady, single-handedly, is changing our traditions, our culture. We, as a people, if we reunify together, we can bring that tradition and culture back. I'm from uh, the Luxelio clan, the small frog. Okay. And I'm from uh, Ganeslaya, House of Many Eyes. I didn't go to university to uh, be, be, uh, be Indian. You know, my school was right here. That's where I grew up, on the territory. In the real world? Yes. Not in the, not in the textbook, but no, in the... No, not in the textbook. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I grew up on yeah. the territory. Mm -hmm. I was packing water at eight, mm -hmm. winter and summer, mm -hmm. trapping at eight, winter time. Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot of people doing that anymore. No, right? no, 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 not nowadays. It used to be very respectful in the past and seems to have disappeared. Can you, you talked a little bit about the office of the Wet'suwet'en. What's their role in all this? Well, the office of the Wet'suwet'en is uh, a form of dictatorship when you sit on the table and you make decisions for your clan without consulting with your clan or your matriarchs. That's not how our tradition is built on. Why do these individuals, why do you think they're doing what they're doing? They're doing it for uh, financial gain, I think, because like I said, Molly's bank account is huge. But there are those around Molly Wickham, John Risdale, and the other anti-pipeline chiefs who have taken the fight against Coastal GasLink one step further. On February 17th, 2022, a group armed with axes and flare guns launched a coordinated attack on a coastal gas link work site and blockaded roads to prevent the RCMP from reaching the location of the attack. The assault caused millions of dollars in damage to CGL equipment and the surrounding environment, while terrified workers who were locked inside their vehicles were forced to watch on helplessly and in fear. While no one has yet to be charged with the attack, footage shows the masked attackers wearing the same camouflage commonly worn by members of the Gidimden Checkpoint, Molly Wickham's group. Of course, if you ask the local Wet'suwet'en members, there's not much doubt of who was behind the attack. How did the community react to that? What was what was? They the were feeling? sickened. They were sickened. They were grossed. People are just so sick of that that someone would go to that extreme. But everybody knows who did it. But no one wants to say anything. But we have to try to prove it. You know, we all know, but proof. You know, society needs proof to, in order for charges. We were expecting something because it was too quiet, but we didn't know what was going to happen and it, it sure blew us away that they would go that far, even to put someone's life in danger. That's not who we are as with Salton people. That's not what we were taught growing up. 
You know, there's people have disputes all the time. It's a matter of sitting down and talking about it, talking with the people that are in opposition. That's, you know, that's what the feast hall was set up for, was to hash out our differences and our disputes. You do it in a peaceful way. The, the true elders and the true matriarchs of our community, most of them must be shaking their head, like, what is this world coming to? This is not who we are as Wet'suwet'en. This is not how we practice dispute resolution. I wanted to check out what these infamous protester camps look like from above and to get a sense of their scale and proximity to the pipeline's construction. So we hired a helicopter to take us above Smithers to survey the surrounding area. So we're here right now just south of Smithers, British Columbia and we're flying over the road that where activists had erected three blockades uh, back in 2020 and also not far we just flew over it where there was the, I don't know how else to call it, the domestic terrorist attack basically in February of this year where they uh, terrorized a bunch of CGL employees and caused what one can only presume to be hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars in damage. So this is where everything all happened. We're also now just about to come up to the second of those blockades at the 44 kilometer mark. This is the blockade that we actually visited in season one and encountered uh, a bunch of protesters who didn't seem to want to have a conversation. And uh, so we're going to give it a flyover and I guess we'll see if, if there's any activity still on the site. Uh, meanwhile, the CGL pipeline is located just over there. The company is planning to complete it in 2023, uh, barring no future and unexpected uh, surprises. After we landed, I went to join Bonnie and other Wet'suwet'en members at the site of the CGL attack to see how the workers had adapted to the new situation where violence against them was a real possibility. Originally we had four trailers on location, two of them are, are left. We were able to demobilize two of them intact with re by reinforcing the walls. So the two that are left, one of them has been demolished in place, the other one is pending. Those were located, I guess, just for reference here, uh, would be straight in behind this excavator and then up against the fence, just in this very northeast corner. So, so how are the guys doing that were traumatized? How are they doing? As far as I understand it, everybody's back to work and everybody's kind of kind of moving past it in their own way. So, and uh, really just striving to move past it, to be honest. Yeah. Now I feel it's a time that the world needs to know what the truth is about the Wet'suwet'en people. And I really appreciate and thank Aaron and his crew for what they're doing for us. Because we had no idea how we're going to get it out there. We can't be those guys as platform to ensure that we capture the absolute truth and that's what we're doing. During my time in northern BC and in the company of the Wet'suwet'en, it became clear to me that this was a people with a deep respect and passion for their history and their culture, but also a people that were beset by deep and painful divisions. Divisions that have been inflamed by outside environmental groups and while made out by many to be about a pipeline, in reality is much more about power, control and who gets the final say. But for protesters or politicians who claim to speak on behalf of the Wet'suwet'en, a note of caution. This is not an issue of emissions, building permits or adequate consultations but an issue surrounding conflicting governance structures and traditions of the Wet'suwet'en people themselves. And ultimately, it will be up to them to come together, find a solution, and chart a path forward united again. There was protests all over Canada, and people were supporting the protesters. They're not Wet'suwet'en. They have no say on our territory. Only the Wet'suwet'en can fix the Wet'suwet'en system. As people, as with Wet'suwet'ens, let's just sit down and have a discussion. You know, we need to work this out because it's our people that are going to suffer. This is wrong. I mean, we should have, a, every one of us should have a say, not closed doors. Nothing's going to get done if they're just looking after their own interests. Hopefully um, our people will get up and stand up and say no more. Our responsibility is to look after the people and the land. And I think that if, if you know, the hereditary system and the elected system sat down and had these frank discussions, 
What a powerhouse the Wet'suwet'en people would be if we all worked together. To hold your head up high to be Wet'suwet'en mm -hmm. on how we used to before. We were proud to be Wet'suwet'en. We have to fight for it. Let's stand up and be proud of it once again. And that's what I'm going to do. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.